Time splits is a very common subject on my channel, it's actually what kicked off my channel's success. The first video that I ever posted to this channel was a Time Splits 2 video, but my history with the series goes back a lot further. It was around 10 years ago now in which I first got my hands on a game in the series, specifically Time Splitters 2. I fell in love with it and my passion for the first FPS game I'd ever played led me to finding out about the entire series, the rest of the games. I was a massive fan of these games as a kid and I'm still a fan of them now. They encompassed a lot of the time that I spent playing games as a kid and even now I go back onto the games for some good old fun because it never ceases to be a good time for me. As I grew up, I would learn about how Free Radical Design, the company behind the games, would fall, and Time Splitters 4 would be cancelled. It was devastating to find out back then, but as time went on, piece by piece, I discovered and found out about the origins of my favourite developer and the games they created, and why they ultimately ceased to exist in the very end. This is going to be a two-part episode, folks, so strap in as I uncover the forgotten, obscure history of the company known as Free Radical Design and their beloved creation, Time Splitters. With topics as old as Free Radical Design and Time Splitters, information becomes harder to find and the solid facts become very hard to verify, but despite all of that, what I can say is there is a clear timeline here, and allow me to go into detail. The roots of the company known as Free Radical Design, and also Time Splitters, date back to the late 90s, at Rare, and with Goldeneye. Goldeneye, for those unfamiliar with the game, is a first person shooter released in 1997 based off the James Bond movie. Released on the N64, it was a massive success. With the success of Goldeneye, Rare had become synonymous with high quality games within the gaming press and the industry. Prior projects like Donkey Kong Country haven't built the reputation Rare would come to have. One year later, in 1998, work on Rare's next major project began, the project that would ultimately become Perfect Dark. It was around this time, in late 1998, that one of the head designers of Goldeneye, David Doak would hand in his letter of resignation. Reflecting back on this, Doak spoke of initial reactions to his departure, one such person being Steve Ellis. Quote, Steve and I hadn't really spoken about it very much. He was pretty shocked when I left Rare, but to Steve's credit, he definitely galvanised me and he's never been the one for inaction. End quote. Doak's decision to leave attracted some significant attention within the GoldenEye team, including that of Carl Hilton. Having always wanted to create his own games in his youth, Hilton made the decision to follow in the steps of Doak, leaving Rare alongside Steve Ellis, Graham Norgate, and Lee Ray. Hilton's decision to leave the company was a difficult one. Quote, Leaving was a very difficult decision, one of the most difficult in my life, because I loved my job and I felt very good there. But deep in me, I had that itchy sensation. I wanted to make a game for myself, a title that I dreamed of as a teenager. End quote. With the five men having left Rare, they would establish a company of their own on October 28, 1998, initially named Geverit. Steve Ellis and David Doak founded the company, while the three employees consisted of Carl Hilton, Graham Norgate, and Lee Ray. It was in February of 1999 that the team would move to Nottingham, Lormax House at Stapleford, Nottingham Road specifically, and using the recently renovated premises of an old factory for long-time bike manufacturing brand Raleigh as their headquarters for game development. The factory had been renovated, leaving it open for businesses to begin using, which proved useful for Geverit. In the process of acquiring some of the factory, a small remnant of the old layout remained, which was used for meetings. Quote, the room was covered in oak panelling, there was a large window and a large fireplace. It was pretty surreal to have our meetings in there, it probably had an influence on time splitters. In that exact same month, a new name was proposed for the company, Free Radical Design. While it's unclear who in particular proposed the name in the first place, the name was accepted and Geverit would no longer be used. The choice of this name stemmed from two different ideas, the first being free to materialise the freedom, radical to match the frank approach of the studio, and finally, design, to demonstrate the importance of the artistic direction in the future games of the team. 
an ideology that Free Radical would keep in mind for every project they developed. The second will be in reference to the scientific term, Free Radical, a term describing atoms or molecules that are fiercely reactive. Shortly after establishing a name for itself, the company would attempt to find a publisher only to be denied on the grounds that it would have to lose the rights to its IPs that it would create. However, soon after these meetings, Free Radical Design was approached by IDOS. Having seen significant success with new and fresh IPs such as Tomb Raider, IDOS believed that the newfound studio could also produce something useful, and thus acquired the right to publish Free Radical's projects. With a name decided and a publisher to promote their projects, Free Radical set out to create its first game. The company initially set out to create a game called Redemption. Although details are unclear about this version of the project, it is known that ideas such as demons were considered. Lee Ray describes it as such, quote, Redemption was the plan. Then Ian Livingstone says, being the fighting fantasy freak that he is, said, yeah, we'll do it, it has demons in it." End quote. Meanwhile, as the team worked on establishing a core narrative and idea for Redemption, Steve Ellis would begin quietly working on an engine for a first-person shooter. His experience of having worked on Goldeneye having given him the technical knowledge and skill to create such an engine. As discussions continued about Redemption, the production of the upcoming successes of the Sony PlayStation, PlayStation 2, was delayed. An opportunity had opened itself up. The direction the team needed to go was decided. To create a first person shooter that would serve as a launch title for the console, the decision to halt Redemption's development was a tactical one on Free Radical Design's part. Quote, we decided to put this title in standby when Sony announced the postponement of the PlayStation 2. There, we realised that if we focused on an FPS with a multiplayer approach, we could finish the project in time, pile for the output of the console. It was an increasingly popular genre, and the success of Goldeneye confirmed it." End quote. With the engine created by Steve Ellis, the team began to work on the initial prototypes of their first game, codenamed, at this point in development, Multiplayer Game. Carl Hilton would use his contacts within the industry to attract more developers to the company. The engine that was quietly worked on by Ellis would provide the team with the technology to envision an idea that they often considered, the journey through time and work on the project would take heavily influence from this. Media such as Quantum Leap would prove to influence the concept of the player becoming involved in each time scenario, becoming a character in that point in time. The films that the team loved also served as influence on the project, as Carl Hilton explains, quote, The idea was to design levels referring to different film genres to have fun with our favourite movies while having some creative freedom, end quote. The overall design plan for locations would also be influenced by movies, Lee Ray describes as such. Quote, Dave Dog would come in and say, we're about to start working on some levels, what do you want to do? I was mad keen on the fifth element at the time, so I said, I want to do a space pot. And he says, cool, great idea, and you get on with it. The emphasis on multiplayer for the project, the name of multiplayer game, came from Dog's frustration with working on Perfect Dark, sometime before he left Rare. Quote, for a long time, the game was just called multiplayer game or multiplayer shooter because that's all you were trying to do. I guess the thing that became a trademark that grew straight out of our frustrations with the N64's performance and how Perfect Dark was running slower and slower every time you added stuff was just trying to get the frame rate high. The emphasis on multiplayer would provide the project with a particular style that would come to make the game in production unique. Unaware that Free Radical had been working on a multiplayer game, Free Radical would show their publisher, Eidos, the current progress on it, to which they rejected, reportedly saying, no, definitely not. Don't do that, we don't want it. Despite their publisher's rejection of the project in its early stages, the team continued to develop the game, months later coming back to them to show progress on it, to which Eidos relented, giving them the freedom to do what they want, and giving the team a small six-figure budget to produce a multiplayer game on, as well as creating a free game contract that Free Radical would adhere to. Around this time, Sony staff visited the premises in which the game was being made on, providing some technical support with the console and providing the company with PlayStation 2 development kits. The game would be a PS2 exclusive, a PS2 launch title, multiplayer game would become known as Time Splitters. While development of the game was at a fine pace, not all aspects of development proved to be beneficial. The team was making a game for technology that had not been developed on before. 
and the building in which the team worked in lacked proper air conditioning in the warm summer of 1999. As a result, Steve Ellis would nearly end up falling out of the building via a window. Quote, Steve Ellis, the chief programmer of our house engine, almost flopped into space while we were in the early stages of development. The premises of our beginnings did not have air conditioning, so we used laptops connected to heat exchangers, NDA, this is a device that allows to transfer thermal energy from a fluid to another, there it was their air conditioner, that we had to hang out a window. It was a very hot summer and we had to install them every morning to be able to work. I remember hearing a scream and turning around, I saw Steve hanging in the air. He was hooked by the fingertips to a very heavy generator. Everyone rushed, we caught him, and we managed to bring him back among us. After this episode, we even decided to take insurance for him. End quote. Despite the setbacks, development was complete, and with development of the game complete, and the marketing for the game being produced, such as trailers, interviews with the developers, and websites to promote the game on, after 16 months of development time, Time Splitters would be released in the US on October 26, 2000 and November 24, 2000 in the EU, in both regions, as a launch title. Demand for the game alongside the PlayStation 2 was incredibly high, causing shortages of both in stores, much to the dismay of Free Radical. Despite this, the game sold extremely well. Carl Hilton describes it as such, quote, it was a huge relief to finish the game on time. It took us almost a full year to complete development, which was a big challenge for a first project. After getting the publisher's approval, the whole team went to the local pub to celebrate with a few beers. I remember, however, that the launch was a big frustration for us because the demand was higher than the supply in the stores. The copies of the game were insufficient, and we had the impression to miss our sales. In the end, it was well received in the magazines, and ran out, so we were satisfied. It would be with the release of Time Splitters that the first roots for a fan base for it had begun to grow. With Time Splitters release on the PlayStation 2, the game was met with high praise, citing the multiplayer as a defining feature of the game, the art style and humour also being a hit with critics and players alike. Despite critical acclaim and having sold over 1 million copies, Eidos also being particularly pleased with the sales, Free Radical was not. The company had expected sales figures similar to that of Goldeneye, the project that they originally made at Rare. Wanted to create something even better than their first game, the team considered continuing progress on Redemption, the project having been on hold since Steve Ellis constructed the first person shooter engine, which would form the core of Time Splitters. However, with their newfound experience from development of Time Splitters, with encouragement from Eidos to pursue a sequel and the determination to create a genre defining game, Time Splitters 2 would begin development just one day after the release of the first game the then 16-man team ready to create a product that would address all issues with the previous project, while adding new features. This time, the sequel would be multi-platform. The first issue to remedy in the sequel was the campaign. Upon release, the story of Time Splitters was criticised for being short and not having the same amount of depth that Goldeneye had offered many years ago. The team would set out to create a campaign that would be equal to Goldeneye, quote, the first game has a restricted solo mode because of the tight deadlines we had, so from the beginning our goal was to develop a solo story that is much more narrative and dense. We spent a lot of time developing the models for each protagonist but also the scenarios for each level. Originally, we wanted a very cinematic approach for our heroes, but this is only the starting point of Time Splitters 2 environments. For the protagonists to fit in with their time, we had to develop their personality so that they could blend in with the story." End quote. The levels in this campaign would become more detailed and complex, enemy AI being tweaked and all in production to become smarter and deadlier, objectives becoming a major part of the level design. Alongside this, another major element that would be added in the sequel would be interactivity. Environmental objects could be destroyed, enemies could be alerted and become suspicious, and set pieces became common. 
all to push for a more immersive experience. The music, provided and created by Graham Norgate, would further push the game to be more atmospheric in general. Quote, the whole audio part was designed by Graham Norgate, one of the founders of Free Radical Design and one of the legends in this industry. I think he really enjoyed working on so many different places, from gothic horror to science fiction, all in one game. Alongside the clearer focus of creating a campaign that would meet players' expectations, the multiplayer would remain the top focus for the project. The designs of weapons, although originally inspired by Time Splitters, would soon take on a form of their own that would stand out from the previous game. Adding a variety of different weapons would prove to be a major goal, weapons such as pistols soon being joined by the likes of homing launchers, laser guns, shotguns, and much, much more. Modes such as Flame Tag, Regeneration and Assault among others would make their first appearance here. One ambitious idea that Free Radical had with creating Time Splitters 2 was online multiplayer, although this was ultimately scrapped in favour of refining the already polished multiplayer mode, despite being announced. The online multiplayer would instead be replaced with LAN functionality, with iLink and System Link being exclusive to the PlayStation 2 and Xbox versions, the GameCube lacking all of these entirely. Other, less notable cuts would include some weapons and some modes, but development remained fairly stable. The initial team of 16 would end up growing to a number of 30, then 50 as development progressed. To accommodate for the increase in number of employees the company had, in July 2002 the company would move out of the space they worked into into Change 25 in Sandaker, where they would remain for the rest of their years. Similar to the first Time Splitters game, marketing would be vital for the game to become popular and for sales to be high. IDOS would advertise the game via web material and trailers that would raise awareness of the game, getting the public ready for the release. With development of the game finished, Time Splitters 2 would be released worldwide on PS2, Xbox and GameCube in October and November 2002, a Japanese and Korean release occurring in early 2003. Like the previous game, Time Splitters 2 would be critically acclaimed, the game also faring well commercially, selling over 2 million copies. But Free Radical was not pleased with these sales figures. Despite this, some employees were satisfied, including Steve Ellis. Quote, Personally, I think the best thing Free Radical ever did was Time Splitters 2. That was the high point of the company, the game that was most like what we wanted to do. Given infinite resources, it's what we could have done more of. End quote. The success of the game will begin to create a dedicated group of fans, fans which will be anticipating the next instalment in the Time Splitters series and for Free Radical's work in general. With the release of the second game, a fan base had been established. Fan site after fan site after fan site would be created to host content relating to the game, and fans would soon find themselves ready for the next Time Splitters game. It would be at this point in time, however, that the relationship between Free Radical and Eidos would abruptly end. With Time Splitters 2 complete, the Free Radical design team turned back to their initial concepts for Redemption. The project had been on hold since the days of Time Splitters 1, and had been on hold since Time Splitters 2. Redemption's progress would be continued. Please note, the following comes from an anonymous source. While the accuracy of this can be disputed, I did research into this information and the names that I was given are confirmed to be those of people that actually existed. Take this information with a grain of salt. The following information provides details into specific events that have not been said before. Again though, take this with a grain of salt. Unbeknownst to the public, however, behind the scenes, the relationship between Free Radical and IDOS had begun to deteriorate. Initially, when the first Time Splitters game was being developed, Free Radical and IDOS agreed to a three game deal in which IDOS would publish three games from this. The teams at both companies had become close, going out for drinks together on regular occasions. However, some tension had begun to grow as Free Radical would face opposition from IDOS over a famous element of the series, Mapmaker. The Mapmaker was a feature in both Time Splitters and Time Splitters 2 that allowed the player to create maps which they can play on. IDOS hated this particular feature, describing it as a waste of time and money. Despite this, IDOS let Free Radical keep the feature in, and it became known as a series staple for the games. Tensions began to brew between developer and publisher, Free Radical feeling controlled by IDOS, and IDOS being ignored. Workers of the publisher being treated as if they weren't friends with the developers, despite the good relationship the two had had up to this point. 
Times players, despite being a success among players and critics, had not sold well enough, disappointing Free Radical. Because of this, Iros and Free Radical worked hard on the sequel, Time Splitters 2, to ensure that it made enough money and proved to be more successful than the last game. Despite this, the game was not as commercially successful as either parties hoped it would be, and the relationship between Free Radical and Idos would deteriorate even further. Seeing the success of the series, Free Radical was soon approached by Electronic Arts. Promised a lot more money and extras than what Idos had been giving them, Free Radical would agree to this deal, but not before severing their ties with Idos for good. With the promise of better treatment by EA, Free Radical had had enough. Tensions had reached breaking point. Quote, it all came to a head when Free Radical decided they were going to fulfill their end of the free game deal by submitting what was called essentially a breakup. It was a shit game used to fulfill their contractual obligation. They submitted a game to Eidos that was so intentionally bad that it was clear what Free Radical were up to. Eidos, disappointed at the deception that Free Radical had been doing, invalidated the contract, letting Free Radical go and the rights to publish the third Time Splitters game going to Electronic Arts. With the relationship between Eidos and Free Radical having ended, Free Radical would soon commit to design and redemption, the project now entering full production. Confident in the project, the team of 150 employees would grow to around 70 to 80, giving the company the manpower to design their next big project. With Eidos no longer in business dealings with them, Free Radical would partner with Activision, who agreed to handle the marketing for their next game. The once considered concept of demons would be replaced with the concept of psychic powers and handling them, and redemption would soon become known as Second Sight. Development was troublesome. While their work on Time Splitters had given them plenty of technical knowledge for first person games, it proved difficult to apply that knowledge to a third person game, which Free Radical had desired to make. Quote, Partly because it was our first third person game, Second Sight had quite the proacted and sometimes difficult development process. We were a little over ambitious in the early stages and had to reduce the size of some of the levels we were building. End quote. While development proved troublesome, the break from doing a Time Splitters project and trying a different kind of game would prove to motivate the team. Quote, it was very refreshing to be working in third person for the graphics, and we were all enthusiastic about the originality of the story we were telling and how we were telling it. We were also very confident about the overall quality of the game. End quote. However, development would soon become more difficult as Activision would pull out of the publishing deal in November of 2003. Activision had come to distrust external development companies such as Free Radical. The situation is described as such by Steve Ellis, quote, We got some way through with Activision. Then they had a day in November 2003 where they made big changes. They decided they didn't like UK development anymore, they didn't like external development anymore, and they didn't like developer-owned IP anymore. Bad for us because we ticked every box. On that day, I think they can 10 projects and in the process put some companies out of business, end quote. With their publisher gone, Free Radical seeked out another publisher that would be able to give the game near complete at this point in time, the marketing it needed, although the hopes for a major marketing scheme had long since been tarnished in the wake of Activision opting out of the project. Free Radical would soon turn to Codemaster sometime after, who agreed to publish the game on PS2, Xbox and GameCube. With the game complete, Second Sight would release on all three platforms in September of 2004 an additional and unplanned release of the game for PC occur in the following year in February of 2005. The game would receive mixed reviews and would be a commercial failure, selling less than a million copies at launch. The game would also suffer from a competing game with a similar gameplay style, PsyOps the Mindgate Conspiracy. While it's unknown if the two games had impacted each other's sales, the interest in Second Sight had been very little. It was unfortunately timed says Doak. I mean, what are the chances of people making two asteroids hit the Earth movies in one year? Must be a million to one, but there you are. And PsyOps came out at around the same time, and that blew our US sales out of the water. You could do more violent things in it, like explode people's heads. The lack of build-up and anticipation to the game's release also seems to have impacted sales. Whoa. I think the lack of a proper build-up phase, when we didn't have a publisher, hurt us more in the long run. A new IP needs to build anticipation and hype in the gaming community, and Second Sight didn't get that chance. While ideas for a sequel were considered, these were ultimately scrapped as Free Radical felt that there was little momentum and interest in Second Sight becoming a full-fledged franchise like Time Splitters was. Despite the disappointing sales figures, Free Radical would soon move onward towards their next major project, one that EA would publish.